Now the dust has settled a little bit, let's talk about this repeal and replace stuff. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Uh, for those of you who are expecting Senate President Ruggiero, he's a little under the weather. He's rescheduled to next week, but he's got a terrific stand in, even though that's not his role. Senator Josh Miller is here to talk business with uh, Mike Stenhouse from the Center of Freedom and Prosperity. Clearly, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to the repeal and replace activity of the Republicans on Obamacare. So let's not uh, mess around here on this Monday evening. We'll forego our usual rundown and get into it. Here's a headline or two reflecting the debate. You know, that happened. And then President Obama got into the mix this weekend. And I find it a pretty fantasy, uh, you know, uh, well, that was a Freudian slip, uh, a fascinating, not fantasizing, but fascinating dynamic that the former president is becoming active here. There was a reason why health care reform had not been accomplished before. It was hard. Accepting an award for courage, President Obama shared recognition with members of Congress who lost their seats supporting Obamacare. These men and women did the right thing. They did the hard thing. Theirs was a profile in courage. Because of that vote, 20 million people got health insurance who didn't have it before. President Obama made no mention of his successor. This is a repeal and a replace of Obamacare, make no mistake about it. Who, three days earlier, celebrated a narrow vote in the House to undo Mr. Obama's signature achievement and replace it with a plan Republicans say will be more effective long term. I hope that current members of Congress recall that it actually doesn't take a lot of courage to aid those who are already powerful, but it does require some courage to champion the vulnerable and the sick. Sticking to the theme of the night, the 44th president urged lawmakers to choose people over parties. It is my fervent hope that today's members of Congress, regardless of party, are willing to look at the facts and speak the truth, even when it contradicts party positions. I, I just think it's going to be interesting for him to be in the American uh, dialogue on this thing. He's not going away like George Bush did, obviously. The Obama care thing is personal. Senator Miller, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Mike, good to see you again. Always, always. good, Dan. Senator. Uh, yep. Mike's got a position paper from uh, the, uh, the policy center, and Josh has a bill. Yeah. So <laughs> both of them are stacked with paperwork, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll get after it. Um, I find it fascinating that the president, the former president, is going to is seemingly is going to stay in this dialogue. Any thought on that? I think it's really important. I think um, people have to first remember back to when what they call Obamacare, the ACA, was passed. That um, that was an incredible compromise that left many people unhappy on both sides, similar to what we're seeing now, except kind of on the other side of the. Uh, the establishment of issues rather than withdrawing issues. And so um, we got to remember back that people were talking about having uh, access to Medicare at least to 50 years old, which in, in the current format would solve a lot of problems instead of making, uh, uh, allowing people, uh, insurance companies to charge five times what you can charge a young person access to Medicare. That's one of the things that was talked about 10 years ago. 3% administrative cost. Okay, so we're kind of getting um, in the middle of the debate. Your thought, yeah. on, you th your thought on the president uh, being active in this dialogue? Yeah, yeah well, normally we, wouldn't l we would like to see a president give the next administration a chance to move forward, but given that yeah. this is the president's signature piece of legislation, I, I, can't, uh, I can't give him an F yeah. or a black mark for this No, one. and I think yeah. what's interesting, I said this early on when this bill was passed years ago, that the day would come back. Uh, well, haunt us might be uh, the, the wrong uh, phraseology, but... Uh, I, I still believe to this day that we would have a much healthier progressive reconstruction of, I don't mean progressive politically, but just progress on health care if his name wasn't attached to it. I think oh, it, 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 it's a very personal yep. thing on both sides of the yep. aisle. Yep. You agree with that? Yeah. Uh, it's too bad. You can't do it. You can't undo it. Him still speaking yep. about it is not going not yep. to change that dynamic. Uh, what comes first, chicken or the egg? You like this. 
You like you like this move by House Republicans last week, correct? Well, at a high level, we we, we believe that a step away from a government-controlled insurance market and government-mandated insurance and government-mandated insurance is in the better interest of families. If they can get lower cost, better quality insurance, we think that's a good goal, and I think that's where this AHCA is trying to go. So, what's your high-level thought before we get into your bill? We're talking about health insurance, not health care. And insurance has always been highly regulated, and that's because there's a fairness factor into insurance. And there's a access to care, and insurance allows there to be access that's less expensive, not more expensive. If everybody's covered, everybody who has access to the insurance lowers the cost of care. That's not and insurance, though. That's what insurance no, is. The more people uh, covered, insurance is risk-based. The, the more a risk people covered, calculation. the more people covered, the less expensive it is. That's well, social engineering equal well, outcomes. Insurance is a risk. That's why we have actuarials, yeah. right, to calculate yeah. risk based on certain pools of well, people. Well, actuarially, yeah. uh, right. d isn't the senator correct when he suggests that the more people buying premiums, the more money in the pool, the the more resources available to pay out. Uh, right, with, within out. their class of risk, yes. Right. But you, you don't say we'll take all class of risk and throw them into a pool. We don't do that with car insurance. We don't do that with home insurance. We don't do that with life insurance. But that's why those policies are reasonably priced. The difference is when you leave out somebody from health insurance, you're making somebody less healthy and therefore more expensive. And they're more expensive for those who are insured. We now have that's universal health care. We now have universal health care in America, and we have the moment we said that we're not going to deny access to health care to anybody, whether they're insured or not. So as long as we're not going to turn somebody away when the rescue pulls up to an emergency room. We, 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 do, we, we yeah. don't do that with yeah. or without the insurance. Uh, right. This Correct. debate but has nothing to do with that philosophy. Yes, it does. Because how you rebuild health insurance impacts the cost of care and the more people you have uncompensated the more expensive it is to those who are insured and so if you propose which we the last week was proposed that we have insurance that covers fewer people then it's going to be more expensive for those who are insured okay. disagree yeah. huh? Disagree. Yeah, disagree because? Insurance coverage does not guarantee health care. People on Medicaid have un, un, unhealthy weights to get in line. Doctors are fleeing the system. Just because you have a card that says, I have Medicaid or some other kind of insurance, doesn't mean you're going to get good health care. People are still going to the emergency rooms because they can't, they can't wait to see a doctor because there's not enough doctors because the Obamacare system is dissent disincentivize doctors and hospitals and other providers from being on the system. All right, why don't we do this? We're gonna, we'll, we're gonna pause here and, and come back and have each of our guests kind of highlight what they think are the most important aspects to the proper type of health insurance program. They've got a policy, he's got a bill. We're also gonna talk about marijuana legislation next too. Well, the bill, I think, was never really seriously designed to, to fix the health care system. It was designed, and the president has stated a number of times, to provide tax cuts to wealthy Americans and also to provide a paper savings so that they could employ uh, additional tax cuts going forward. But a hasty, ill-conceived uh, bill passed without even any clarification by the Congressional Budget Office is, is inadequate. Uh, you know, I have to say just my own point of view on Senator Reid's commentary. You know, the tax cuts are really just a wipeout of the taxes that came in with Obamacare. Uh, the second uh, point, though, that he makes is an absolutely good one, which is I don't know what the House Republicans are doing not scoring that thing. Thankfully, the Senate, by law, has to score this thing before they come up with a, a bill. Um, that's a constitutional safeguard, or at least a statutory one. Um, your top couple thoughts here as to what you want to see in health care legislation, period, and whether it marries up to what the Republicans did last week. Right, my top thought is actually a little bit different, if, if I may, and I'll make a plea to, to Senator Miller. You know, there's a good chance something's going to 
pass up there in D.C., right? I don't know if, if it'll look like this or something different, but it's likely to pass after our session closes, right, in, in, in about four to six weeks. Meaning our state session. Our state session. Right. So I, I, we're, our press release tomorrow is going to be asking lawmakers to put together a responsible process to evaluate the federal law whenever it gets passed so we don't have to do it the last minute next January. or don't have to do it behind closed doors you know, in the governor's office or the speaker's office or the Senate president's office. That's actually a good question. We, we need a process, whether it's yeah. a commission, a fall session, something so that we can properly and publicly evaluate What's the this? chatter up on the Hill in terms of just reaction last week? And, and the governor mentioned nothing that when other Well, I'll that propose that my me. legislation does what he's talking about. Which is? Okay. My legislation is called the Health Insurance Market Stabilization and Consumer Protection Act of 2017. Say that three times fast. <laughs> I can't. I actually had to have that, even though, <laughs> even though it's uh, um, our legislation. Actually, it's the legislation of the Senate President when he came, uh, when when he was elected a couple of months ago. What he started was. Uh, a group of us who were um, appointed to watch policy, and this is the first bill of that group to watch policy. And to Mike's point, what this says is we are going to stabilize the market by saying the essential things that the ACA or Obamacare stabilized should stay the in place. The 10 essentials as a 10 as essential as benefits, um, ac lifetime access to benefits, um, no caps those kind of things that people are really panicked will go away and that probably will occur in the Senate version that they stay and so I feel it does some of what Mike's saying and it really calms the fears so that we can get go forward and and look a year from now you know um, anything the Republicans do on the federal level right now it probably won't have an implementa implementation date of probably till 2020. Right now, in May, they're going to have to, the insurers are going to have to propose what their rates are for next year. So they're in a very difficult situation. They would prefer legislation with this, like this. We've actually met with them. Yet there are some because there, there, because it gives predictability to what they have to uh, propose. Yet there for are next some year. retroactive <laughs> tax repeals in this whole thing, which yeah. to 2016, which makes it only. Uh, yep. more confusing. Yep. Um, Governor Raimondo said this about the pre-existing condition situation on the radio the other day. So the unfortunate reality is that lots of folks who are covered now just aren't going to be covered or they're going to be covered but with incredibly high deductibles, incredibly high out-of-pocket costs and that's why this makes me so upset. You shake your head, you, complete, you fundamentally disagree with her projection. Listen, the level of demagoguery is irresponsible about this bill. Uh, the, the governor said herself on uh, another new TV network that she hasn't dug into the bill yet, but yet she's making all these claims, as is Congressman Cicilline, about people being kicked off insurance and people dying in the streets. This is irresponsible. As the senator has sort of alluded to, and as we said, there are serious issues that our state, if this bill passes, states are going to be left with a lot of decisions to make and options. And somebody needs to talk about those seriously. We don't need this kind of political demagoguery going on. Well, we need is, some adults well, in the room. Well, her, you know, her, no, these her, are her, words her. on paper that actually say, this is how we're going to go forward. Rhode Islanders don't have to worry about losing essential benefits. The, the Republican proposal actually says that states can abandon essential benefits. We're talking about when we say a state can abandon essential benefits, that you can abandon maternity care. So if your teenage daughter unexpectedly becomes pregnant, no. the maternity is not covered that's if false. you're that's opt false. out. That's, that's false. That's no, what that's an false. essential benefit is. Here's the, here's no, the distinction false. that people yeah. don't, don't you know, get. Why do I have to pay for that? Well, why do I have to buy maternity benefits? That, you know, for when, when, when you call it an essential yeah. benefit, you're yeah. saying I have to buy maternity benefits. Yeah. Well, why that's the, well, see, this why is, do I have to do that? This is the distinction that I think we need to be talking about. There, there are minimum standards for for regulation of health ins the health insurance industry, what they must cover. And then yeah. you're suggesting that the marketplace will provide insurance companies to provide coverage what past I want. the minimum standards. What I want. Or less, yeah. depending on what well. you want to shop for. So what's interesting is, do you think that we will end up moving in Rhode Island to a model that not only compensates on, on finances, but philosophy? Meaning, if we, see, if we see significant Medicaid cuts, remember the 
health care exchange, which is running remarkably smoothly here in Rhode Island, is 70% dominated by people who are on Medicaid, which is a federally funded program. Yeah. So if Rhode Island gets hit by that, there's going to be a two or three or four hundred million dollar annual decision that the government's going to have to make to plug that hole. Do we agree on that? Do we stipulate on that? Sort of, but not in the way you're thinking. Yeah. What, uh, Nobody's going to get kicked off Medi Medicaid. No one's going to lose their funding for Medicaid dis despite those federal cuts. Actually, Medicaid rolls will, will. No, Medicaid rolls will lessen by attrition when the expandability parameters are, are lowered back to where they were before Obamacare. No one's going to be thrown off. No one's going to have if their money you taken away. currently proposed, if you block grant a state 25% less than what they're block granted now, a state's going to have to decide mm -hmm. to drop 25% Well, that's of the a state who are option to it. decide whether they want to do well, that. Well, that's the, yeah. the, the, I don't know why yeah. you, you confused the issue. I mean, that's exactly what he's yeah. talking about Well, here. they're making it yeah. sound like the federal law is going to mandate that people lose their insurance coverage. No, that's, that's not going to uh, happen. What I'm saying is there's a difference between philosophy and funding. If there's less money in the till, but it's going to be... But the state would have to make that... Option Duh, itself. that's what I said. So it's if they don't want to lose the funding, they, they don't take the It's option. going to be a two or three or four hundred million dollar state decision. Only if they decide it. But what well, it's, well, we're talking about... Well, if you want to keep the same amount of people know, insured on the health exchange, yeah. you're going to have to put the money up to do so. And so those same people oh. will have health care needs. And it's just going to be matter... It's, the difference will be whether those needs will be met by uncompensated care which everybody agrees is the most expensive way to access health care. So if those people are dropped, it becomes 100% either municipality or state expense. Nobody gets rather dropped. Rather than a shit. If you're Nobody getting, gets dropped. If you're getting 75% of the money you got Nobody gets forced off legally, legally, but if the funding's not there, someone oh. has to pick up Two the, options. Somebody has Keep to pick Medicaid up the Medicaid the way it is. Everybody on it gets funded under federal mandates right now. That's option A for a state. Option B for a state, if they so choose. But the funding mechanism the, for option A is going to be changing. No, it's not. It's for option B is when you change. That's what I'm trying to say. You can choose to keep things as they are now, okay? With, with, or you can choose to have more flexibility with how you spend that money and go for option B. With less money. Yes. Okay. If, if so our state if lawmakers choose that option. To do it with less money, you're going to have to choose. That would be choose. up to you and your colleagues. Yeah up to us to ensure fewer people. But you could also choose to keep things the way they are now. Which would make it more expensive for our hospitals, more expensive for our insurers. Not with lower Because with lower we eligibility have a roles. system, that there's still this, we still have the same patient. Every person in the state is a patient, whether they're insured or not. All right, let me ask you this. Okay? Let me ask you this, because there's stuff we yeah. want to get to. Do you see, where Mike, where Mike sees, and, and where a lot of Americans do see, an environment in Rhode Island where we will be able to at least buy less insurance than the 10 essential mandates? In other words, if somebody wants to lower their costs, get into a health insurance plan, will there be options for, for the insurance industry to offer less than the 10 mandates to a shopper exactly. out there? If you do that, that person is just as likely to need what he opted out of, whether he opted into that or not. Well, he makes that decision. Are you? Gonna, yeah. Are we going to have a state environment where if he opts we allow out, people to make those essential, decisions? One of the essential benefits is prescription drugs. He can assume right now that he doesn't want to pay for pres prescription drugs because he only takes one drug, right? And he can afford to take that one drug. Then what happens tomorrow? when he gets in an accident or he acquires a condition or he gets cancer and now he's on 20 drugs. So he's going to, we're going to pay for those 20 drugs because he opted out of drug coverage, prescription drug coverage. We're going to pay for him instead of him. But if he's continuously because it's coverage, going to be, it's go, he's going to get those saw, drugs anyway but, but because we have we have a pre If we have a pre-existing pre uh, you know, mandate still, yeah. then, you know, in continuous coverage in place, that person can, can upgrade their, their health insurance policy, seems to me. By the way, the pre-existing yeah. condition thing is a mess. Uh, this waiver thing, if you think that $8 billion is going to be enough to be in a pool spread yeah. out through 50 well, states. Eight on top of a, that was eight additional billion on top of $133 billion already in that pool. Yeah, well, there So were, it's $140 billion. At the yeah. end of the day. Uh, For a $320 billion problem is what's Your the, bill uh, gets, here, yeah. gets heard soon? It was heard last week. We've actually sat down with many of the insurers since then 
and with a few changes they'll support it because it, as the bill is called, the Market Stabilization Quickly, Act. I want to ask about so, that so the senator's bill, in our opinion, would go against what the federal law is. The federal law is trying to Thank open goodness. up like what you were saying, more <laughs> options, lower cost options, less mandates for more consumer choice. The senator's bill would enshrine all this high level of mandates so that consumers have no choice. All right, when we come back, there's some pending pot legislation. We'll get a couple of minutes on that. Stay with us. If I was a betting man, I would have to say that uh, it would be turned into a commission and we'll be studying that issue. How we regulate it, what the regulations are, and to what extent we regulate it. It's going to be important to the, to the passage of the bill at some point in time. Or if we go the Senator Rogerio McCaffrey, Senator Rogerio will be here next week, I'm told. Um, you're a mover and shaker on legalization of marijuana. I have been for six or seven years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, essentially, we are where? We have a bill, and we have had a bill for, set for six or seven years that would tax and regulate marijuana, similar to what Colorado, Washington, Vermont just uh, legislated on it. The governor hasn't signed it yet, but I think both the House and the Senate voted on it. Um, Massachusetts, as everybody knows, Maine coming very aggressively, Connecticut potentially. Um, and so we have a bill that would basically do uh, the same thing as several other states have, and have done. And essentially, it, it's going to do what? We uh, forget just you know joining the crowd here. It's going to do exactly what? But what kind of what kind of outs will the communities have? Where they say you know we don't want these establishments in our. They towns. can referendum that out. I was wondering if 39 yeah. communities or however we have how many we really have, yeah. all of them referendum out. It would it would render the legislation null and void, sure. wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. At least you admit that. What's yeah. your thought about that? Well, we, we agree with the commission approach. Um, we, we understand the pros and cons of it from a revenue point of view, from a libertarian point of view, but what we really aren't thinking about is the impact it's going to have on real families and on workplaces. Uh, we don't know how more substance abuse of any kind, whether that be alcohol or anything, marijuana, is good for any family or any society. I guess a distinction society. between use and abuse, right? Well, but even just use. You know, how is, how is more of anything good? But we also did a policy brief about a month ago on the, the impact, potential impacts on workplaces for employers who want to maintain a drug-free workplace. Mm. There, there's now a constitutional happen, conflict there yeah, that's without a, adequate protection that's well, If you look at employers. the other states, uh, you know, use by young people, which none of us want, and we, f we feel that tax and regulate actually gives you resources so less young people are accessing marijuana. Uh, right now they access marijuana that's not tested, that's not regulated, and is sold by somebody that would just as soon sell something that could kill them. And so in a tax and regulated market, it's tested, so they're not getting something that's uh, laced with something that's poison. Um, it gives revenue to the state to actually uh, prevent addiction. Um, based on substances that are addictive, which marijuana is the least addictive of, including tobacco and alcohol. Projection. Uh, yep. We're going to we're gonna get a commission or we're going to get a, a vote up and down on a bill? What we hope, propose to do in an amended bill is put any issue that people are still concerned about in Rhode Island into a commission and you don't pass that part of the bill, you don't implement that part of the bill, you don't implement that policy, whether it's edibles or workplace safety, okay. until the legislation. All right. Well, that opens up a whole other passes. can of worms, which yep. we'll talk about next time we get together. Yep. Thanks. Good to see yep. you, Senator Michael. Thank you. Pleasure. Senator, final yep. word, and we we'll come back to the rules. Tomorrow here still to be determined, but uh, former Governor Chafee will be here on Wednesday. Make a note of that. We'll see you at three o'clock until six on WPRO Radio tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Good night.